Yeah, the title of this panel is Delayed Impact of uh, COVID-19 in the Real Estate Sector in 2021, Myths or Truths. And um, as usual for the audience, if you have any questions for the attendees um, of this panel, please write it into the chat and um, we will collect it for the Q&A session in the end. And before we now start with the content, I would like to ask you guys for a brief introduction. And um, just very short from my side, I am Lars, I'm an online entrepreneur and investor, and I built up one of the biggest German peer-to-peer -peer investor communities in the last years and try to help to develop this industry. But um, now don't waste time with me. And now let's come to our panel crew. Maybe Martinez, you can start with your short introduction. Sure. So my name is Martinez. I'm a CEO for crowdfunding platform Rondga. We operate in Lithuania. We specialize in real estate development crowdfunding. So we are now operating for a little over three years. We are um, mainly working with large real estate developments. So our usual loan tickets are, are above 1 million euros. So I think it will be something that we could, we will be able to share you about you know, how does primary real estate market, uh, how it was doing during the COVID-19 crisis and how were we handling all the uh, issues that have arose. Okay, thanks for that. Because do you want to continue? Yeah, can you hear me all right? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, great. Yeah, we are Valka State. We are crowdfunding and food buying platform. We are in the market uh, for more than two years right now. We were established in 2016. Uh, quite a small platform, I would say. We are its turnover by keeping, keeping around. Uh, not more than 15 million euros, and we are going to, uh, to, to food buying deals as well. So, we have finished uh, one of the largest food buying deals so far here in Riga for almost 5 million euros. So, we are, we are at the final stage of this also. It's a few words. So, my name is Edna I uh, am running a company called Vilia. This is a real estate investment firm uh, focusing on real estate development projects. We are uh, very strong in a very strong partnership with a uh, peer-to-peer lending platform Twino, and uh, not all, but uh, most of our existing portfolio projects are uh, financed uh, with the support of uh, Twino platform. So, but we also are uh, very uh, down to earth, let's say, in the real estate industry. Okay, thanks for the introduction for now. And um, yeah, as I as I told before, so if you have any questions under each other, other so please um, ask ask questions and um, yeah, have a natural discussion. So um, first of, no, of all, we are now in uh, 2021, and I guess for you all, 2020 was a very unique year. And in the last event, we heard some very interesting insights from consumer lending platforms and how they managed that year especially in this uh, hot phase during the sh European shutdown crash. Um, maybe you can give us a short wrap up how you managed 2020. Um, maybe Igor, you can start this time. Yeah, so, I mean, we started 2020 quite, quite fine. I mean, the January and February was great. Uh, we thought that everything will be fine and uh, we thought that uh, ahead of us is a large uh, development, but then uh, then the March came, the COVID, then everything just been frozen. It's, uh, I mean, because we're, we're developers ourselves as well, every, there was a lockdown, everything was, everything was frozen, uh, all, all the construction work stopped, and uh, it's just nothing happened. And just the three months uh, that we were waiting, March, April, May, I would say we were waiting and uh, looking what, what was going to happen. And, uh, uh, the prices went uh, down a little bit, I would say, not in the real estate prices, but everyone just stopped buying and selling. Uh, but then thanks God, uh, June came, the COVID uh, was, was even over, and uh, the prices, at least in, in Latvia and Estonia, they went back, so it's, it's bounced back and uh, everything started again. Uh, but, but again, because of the COVID, there were several platforms that the scams and maybe the weak platforms that didn't survive. But it's, it's also with the COVID. It's, 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 it, that, that was an issue as well. 
for the investors and uh, I mean not the best year I would say in the past year in, 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 uh, in crowdfunding but uh, but it showed that at least uh, who is who is strong I mean that's that's what investors were talking all about so every, everyone is talking in 2019 that uh, will a crowdfunding market will be able to survive financial crisis in a way so we had one of the last last crisis in 2008 so 2020 we can say that was another another crisis and i would say that the whole all the uh, good platforms survive it and now investors can look back and say that maybe those guys who survived it they 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 um, um, yeah so so they uh they were able able to survive so maybe they will leave in the future as well so we're waiting for the vaccination to happen in 2021 and i'm, I'm hoping that uh, march march april may will, will be able to, to return to the normal life uh, with the covid but with the real estate as well so yeah okay thanks for that martinez how was it for you the last year uh, maybe I could share a couple of slides here, so we could then uh, yes, we'll show how it went for Lithuania. So uh, I have a couple of slides that depict uh, real estate, primary real estate market activity in Vilnius, Lithuania. Uh, so to to have an understanding, so Vilnius is the capital of Lithuania, and it cons it, it makes you know, ninety five percent of all real estate transactions happen here. So what you see here is a uh, monthly primary real estate market transactions. So it's new apartment buildings and the apartments sold there. So during 2019, you know, you, we had a, a very good year in the market. And uh, as, as, as Igor also said, you know, January and February seemed just as good, maybe very good. And then when March struck, and April came, uh, and there was a, you know, a, an apocalypse and nobody knew what, what will happen next. So at that point, we had a couple of real estate projects that we were planning to finance and we were quite ready to launch them on the platform. Uh, but we had to reach out to the developers and, and renegotiate with them, you know, launch of the projects just to be sure that you know, we don't start developing new assets uh, in the time when, you know, it's not really certain that there will be someone buying them. Uh, what happened at the same time, there were a lot of press releases from major developers uh, saying that they are discontinuing new developments or at least postponing them. So there was a lot of Mm, a lot of scare in the market without knowing what will happen. What was, what was interesting, however, that when trans amount of transactions fell drastically, the prices didn't fell. And there were a lot of people who would say, I will buy an apartment with 15% discount, but nobody sold them. So what would happen that market just became illiquid, but not, but, but prices didn't crash because sellers were, uh, sellers had strong financials and background for that when we started researching was that back in 2008 when the first financial crisis struck real estate developers were caught unprepared and this time everyone had resources to to sustain for another year so even if they would have these assets unsold they were quite okay to just to just to, to wait it through but what what happened next was uh you know just as soon as quarantine was removed and as soon as uh, notaries uh, came back to work the sales rebounded so you know starting from may uh, or june we as a platform actually we we felt it like uh, like 2019 the year was really good starting from from may uh and reason for that was that as we understood was that people who were planning to acquire apartments, uh, their willingness to do that, it didn't went away. And the difference between the two crises, 2008 and 2019 to, or 2020, 
uh, was that it was not a financial crisis. It, it, it meant that people didn't lost their jobs, or at least the, the, the majority of the people. So they were just working from home. It was not work from office. And therefore, their income didn't fail. Their needs for life and, and, and for, new, for new living areas didn't change. And as soon as market came back to, you know, to, to as soon as you could got a beer uh, in the cafe outside, you were avail able to buy an apartment and, you know, by, by August, we were back at 2019 levels. Uh, and then, you no, know, the year ended with record sales in, uh, in November and, and, and December. Uh, however, we are not, you know, saying that we don't we don't think that it will sustain at this level. Uh, at, our belief is that actually market will, you know, what we have here is a carryover effect that just people who were planning to buy an apartment in March, April, May, they're you know they're completing their transactions, you know, in the second half of the year. Therefore. We have this these a couple of spikes, but if you would level out, the year would look look just like 2019 on average. So, uh, so that that's what I wanted to show, and I think that us uh, as a platform, we we had a decent year. It was marked with a lot of uncertainty at the very beginning. Uh, so we had to postpone the projects that we were planning, but you know then in in, 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 in May and June, we, we were starting to operate full speed and we had a, a very good year at the end. Okay, on your slide, it looks like it was just a short shock for the investment uh, community. Um, would you agree to that? Uh, it was very interesting, by the way, that uh, it, in March, we, I mean, we, we are obviously, all of us are, are are looking how our colleagues are doing, uh, other crowdfunding platforms, and we saw a level of transactions falling drastically in peer-to-peer -peer lending uh, platforms. But we saw a quite healthy decrease in transaction in in most of the real estate crowdfunding platforms. It meant that real estate crowdfunding platforms didn't crash. It it was obvious that people feel confident when they have real estate. Uh, as a collateral for their investment. It, it, it felt more real and more secure than consumer loans. So we, we felt decreasing in activity during those months where you saw the, the drop in, in apartment sales because people were uncertain there. But at the same point, we saw a spike in activity as soon as quarantine was over. Uh, which I which I think is is a lot related to two factors. One is that for quarter of the year, people were saving money and very cautious. So now they had some capital accumulated that no no they 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 would have invested, but they haven't. So they're investing it right now. So again, we have a carryover. And the second effect perhaps was that since we had this lockdown, I mean, a lot of us had to to forget our vacation in Italy. Uh, and therefore, you know, you have another one or two or 3,000 euros in your pocket. And then you start thinking, you know, what you should do with it. So we saw a strong trend in Lithuania that people became in, interested in investing, thinking, you know, so, okay, so now I have some money. Well, what should I do with it? How to get some, some uh, passive income, which would allow me to sustain through another crisis if, if I lose my job. Yeah, yeah, I can absolutely confirm this also from my own experience. Um, I mean, I was traveling the whole last year in, in the first half of the year, and uh, now I cannot travel anymore. But um, yeah, of course, I have to do something with the money. Um, Edgar, how how was it for for Twino in the last year, or especially for the real estate part? Um, I would say this was one of the most interesting years in uh, my professional career. Uh, my personality is built that I really like challenges, so it was really, really interesting. Uh, despite that, uh, we had to, to do a lot of stuff people don't like to do. 
So we started the last year with, I think, five transactions in the process. So we were acquiring uh, buildings to renovate, land plots to develop new projects. And all of those transactions, luckily, I am really honest, really luckily, didn't close before COVID started. So some of them were in negotiations. Some of them we had already uh, agreements drafted. And when well, I think it was mid of March, uh, we really uh, reevaluated everything. So we took uh, actually like uh, used the handbrake. So we decided we're going to stop for uh, now for, from buying or acquiring any assets. And we're going to evaluate what's happening. And um, of course, as a, as an organization which doesn't see uh, how the year will end, uh, one of the things we did, we uh, cut the operational costs. All our team uh, had a nice uh, haircut in terms of salaries and all the costs, which is, I think uh, makes sense in such situation. Then uh, everyone uh, focused totally on their kind of most important tasks. The project managers uh, focused uh, on continuing with projects which were initiated. And the analytic uh, team, uh, we started to build a special tool for us to monitor every available data to understand what's really happening in the market because we understood that we don't want to make any investment moves unless we understand really what's happening in the market. So we started to build an analytical tool uh, covering, I think, like 50 data sources, um, some of them public, some non-public. And uh, we continue to update it to, uh, till today. We update it, I think, weekly, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, from that uh, data, we started to make uh, future decisions. And from those five transactions we had uh, in the pipeline before COVID started, um, I think we canceled four of them. But one of them we still uh, continued after a couple of months. We understood that it's still a very good deal, no matter what. And I think we're really happy about that uh, transaction. And the other ones, uh, they stalled. Uh, some of them we will never continue because we don't see a business there anymore. The market has changed. Some of them uh, we just uh, can't close because the seller is, I don't know, in another uh, galactic. Um, and what I personally was doing uh, since March, I... Uh, I think I am one of the best uh, Spotify podcast listeners uh, in, in Riga because I, I, uh, I was listening to uh, podcasts about real estate from all around the world on a daily basis. So any free moment I had or any movement I needed to do, I was just listening what's happening everywhere in the world. Maybe yes. I, can, I can add a little to what Edgar was saying about... Sure. Actually, we had the same with our, with our business that you know, we... We cut down a lot of operations and, and, and stopped a lot of projects that were going on. But, you know, I think it was the same with the investors and with us businesses that for the first month we were stopping everything. And there we knew, therefore you had this halt in, in all the businesses across the every industry. But then the next month everyone understood that, okay, People are still there. They're using the internet. They're working from home. We should get back to work. And then all of a sudden, you had to restart the operation with a bit different mindset on, 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 on how things will go. Uh, perhaps the only difference that we noticed in, in Vilnius, compared to what I heard here from Edgar, is that, for example, in Vilnius, transactions were postponed for a month, but, but I haven't heard of any transactions that were canceled or became uninteresting for the for the buyer so we had as you know this one month of i'm not sure whether i'm selling and i'm not sure whether i'm buying but then you know next month everyone went to notaries and and, and, and life went just as usual okay yeah thanks for for at this um now i can suspect um maybe I... a, internet connection is not always super stable uh, so I understand you heard the Spotify thing. Yes. I wanted to say that uh, um, unfortunately here in Riga, we don't set rules for global uh, real estate investment uh, market. So we have to follow the, the investment agenda, what is happening. So that's why I kind of I followed 
the, the leading European uh, real estate investors and, and American real estate investors to understand where the direction is. And, and based on that, we actually created our new investment strategy. We uh, strike through some ideas we had before, and now I think we kind of I still every day hear and hear that uh, a data and opinion which confirms our approach. Um, and and what happened is that uh, we actually uh, focused on a growing team uh, after we understood that the market still develops, and then we started to look for new properties to acquire. And since then, we acquired. Uh, two new properties since the COVID crisis, and we still have uh, several properties in the pipeline to acquire. So I would say uh, we are not even uh, back on track, but we are actually back on a, back on a very good track. And if we talk about peer-to-peer -peer lending and real estate lending, uh, we had a, a, an agreement with uh, Twino that uh, our projects will be financed uh, through a platform, and then. COVID started, and the question was when to do that. And so jointly, we agreed that we're going to risk and see uh, how the investors uh, react to an idea that uh, uh, in the mid of the crisis, we launched real estate uh, projects to be financed through the platform, which was called to, and still is called uh, Twino Ventures. And actually, it was really successful. I think we, uh, we, uh, the, the, we raised in a month uh, the first uh, tranche. And since then, we see that. Uh, let me see the statistics. Since then, we uh, yeah, every next tranche we make it much faster. And I think we raise now in a week uh, the, the tranche what we expect. I think last year we raised 1.3 million euros for our projects through the platform, and we expect to continue doing that uh, this year. I have to uh, underline also that um, based on the existing situation in the real estate platforms. Still up to date, uh, peer to peer lending is more focused on uh, higher risk uh, tolerance for the investors because I haven't seen any successful crowdfunding or peer to peer lending uh, for an uh, interest rate of 4 or 5 percent, which would be a uh, lower risk uh, um, say spectrum of the real estate investments. Uh, but what I see from this, um, let's call it uh, Institutionalization, or how to call it properly, uh, the fact that more and more the, the platforms will be regulated. I think that we're going to come up uh, this year or latest next year uh, and see in the peer to peer lending platforms and also in the crowdfunding platforms projects uh, funded with much lower interest and with much lower uh, risk spectrum, which I think is quite important uh, for, the, for the industry to grow. And uh, Coming back to the analytics tool, I just want to show you if we talk about the statistics. Um, I'll just uh, share you a uh, screen of our tool. Uh, what, what actually was happening during the March is the same, most probably, what almost in every country is that the real estate uh, transactions dropped from, let's say, in, uh, in that year was 1,200 per week to so 500 per week. And then we see that the back uh, to that level around uh, July, August, and continue to work in the same direction. So basically, we see that the market is back on track and the transactions are happening even better than it was year before. And the other thing that is very important for us, we were monitoring the construction industry. And here, for us, the most important was the construction confidence indicator. And for us, the, the good sign was that uh, the construction uh, confidence indicator went to almost minus 40. So what we see now that we successfully used this data and the situation in the market, getting the lowest possible uh, construction costs um, in the last, I don't know, few years. So that's actually uh, the benefit we got for real estate investment projects is that we managed to cut down the construction costs for the projects. But I will be honest, uh, this benefit will end in a few months, so that's just a good timing. Okay, thanks for that. Um, maybe an additional question to your company. So you said you have your own company, but you're working together with Twino in this project, Twino Ventures. Um, can you explain a little bit how this collaboration between you is okay. working? I actually have to clarify then. Uh, so 
Aquilia is owned by two shareholders on an equal uh, proportion, me and Armand Cross, uh, who is also uh, the sole uh, shareholder of uh, Twino platform. And so basically, uh, these two companies are not only partnering, but uh, share the same beneficiary. And uh, from my experience, I think this is quite important because in real estate, if we talk about financing real estate, I had a historical experience with uh, financing real estate projects as well. And one very uh, important uh, part of uh, evaluating projects in finance is to minimize the risk of, um, let's say, these uh, sponsors not following the business plan, let's call it that way. And it's always very tricky. You can evaluate their historical experience, how good they did previous projects. You can put mortgages, mortgages, whatever you want, but still you are never, uh, you can never secure this risk. And in these cases, we have shared the shareholder in Aquilia and the shareholder in Twino, uh, like the interests are aligned. So this risk is not on the table. So the, the cost uh, also of kind of evaluating the projects for Twino team and, and uh, so this risk is less uh, kind of to be looked at uh, in terms of uh, like if you compare with a regular approach in uh, real estate financing. Okay, thanks for. Yeah, uh, I have a question. question for clarification. Did I get it right? Uh, you are like sort of a real estate developer to raise capital in Ukraine, right? But isn't it? I guess you have some issue with with the new directive coming in, right? The European directive. To be honest, uh, I actually have to uh, make a Chinese wall. <laughs> I'm okay. not uh, involved in Twino business, so I cannot okay. comment on the platform business. And I think you should invite then uh, somebody else from Twino. Okay. Team. Understood. Understood. Um, my responsibility is to have a successful uh, real estate investment projects. So this is what I can talk about from early morning to late night. Okay, thanks for that. Um, no, Lars, it, it, it was interesting that Edgar mentioned that interest rates should be going down and, and, and you know, that the, the biggest risk, I think Edgar, you were with the same guru, right? Yeah. Proud estate. I was before Proud. with Proud estate, Lloyd. Yeah, so you know, it, it, it's, it's interesting you mentioned this because we saw the same issue that, uh, you know, that we are operating for three years, but for a long time, due to conservative approach and, and not wanting to deal with uh, developers who have a, even though they have a good mortgage and they could provide a good mortgage uh, you don't want to deal with some funny guys because you, you just just looking at them you know that something will go wrong and uh, and real estate financing business is not recovery business that collateral mortgage if you are doing business right it should not be a main business or that you it will go in default and then you will recover. No, it's quite 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 the opposite. It should be the last resort. And if a well selected project doesn't pay in time, you activate the recovery. So in this uh, three years that we're doing this, we actually noticed as well that you know at interest rates that we are uh, having right now, it's let's say nine ten percent annual interest, it's nearly impossible to have uh, decent real estate developers. So we are working on reducing interest rates to bring in better quality developments, you know, so just, you know, just to avoid these funny guys in, in the, the pipeline. And then, you know, at, I think it, that the interest rates will settle that at, that if you have a, uh, if you have a completed cash flow asset it will mortgage at 5%. And if you have a real estate development, it will go at 7, 7 to 8. Then will be the breakthrough when you have actually really good real estate development you know, companies coming in, not just uh, people who accidentally got a, a very good asset in their balance sheet. Yeah, that, that leads a little bit to the next question. If we compare now this um, consumer lending and real estate lending, we didn't see last year that huge problems or rumors in the real estate platform. Um, can you explain why it was um, comparable, very silent in your reach, um, despite to, to the consumer lending? Maybe Igor, you can, you can start with this. 
I mean, no, if we're talking about the bulk state, obviously we are giving money, uh, we are not giving money for some, some shops or, or this kind of business, so we are giving money for the collateral as a mortgage. Uh, most of our projects we are giving out uh, money so far without monthly payments, so, so obviously we had some issues with the projects that employed you. Uh, what well, the maturity was, uh, for example, last year we had one of the most beautiful uh, projects with a finance in four stages. We had to pay back uh, uh, last year's summer, so he's in default right now, unfortunately, and that's uh, exactly because because of the of the COVID, because he's, he's got the luxury luxury cars, luxury flats, he wasn't able to sell them, and uh, because the, the borders were closed, and most of his, his buyers were from 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 not not around the European Union, so so he unfortunately he stuck with the COVID, and so that that made all trade in the bulk state of Rwanda let's say four uh, percent. Uh, yeah, precisely. So uh, that, that's the main reason for us because uh, most of the maturities that were, for example, last year, people were able to repay because, because again, it was the summer or, or, or it was spring, uh, everyone was able to, to sell the premises and to repay. But uh, now we will see what, what, what the 2021 will show whether there are any defaults or or delays but for the consumer lending I mean, obviously you are, you are giving the money for a month or for three months time and, and, and obviously so if you gave the money in, in 2019 or at the beginning of 2020 persons you have to repay the money during the COVID with all this lockdown and, and everyone's being fired and all this. so for the real estate this is just very simple it's, uh, there are no monthly payments, so you, you can just wait. For example, we had some we had some projects that said that they are unable to repay in 2020 as well, and we agreed with the investors that we will just refinance them, we will just postpone, and they will just uh, repay this 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 interest rate. So that, that's the main difference. Just just uh, the project the turnover, the project is called 18 month for real estate, and the consumer lending is, is month. So I would say that's, that's the main difference. Thank you. Oh, do we want well, to well, add well, something? <laughs> yeah, Matthias. Yeah, I think that, for example, one 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 difference that we see and why it, why it went quite well for us was that uh, I think that we should bear in mind that consumer lending in most of the case is is uh, you know, consequence of poor finance planning for some people I mean when they take a consumer loan so we have to keep in mind that this is a most uh, fragile or most uh, vulnerable part of the society which in case of COVID-19 most likely it were them who who had issues with their jobs and then you know when we're talking about real estate financing and if we're talking in particular real estate development or businesses that that give real estate as collateral if you do a good analysis of whom are you lending to most likely their business case is is solid enough to you know to pull through three or six months of uh, of well not starvation but slowdown in the market so it's one thing that you have a, a much more professional counterparty on the other side so in our case we we had monthly pay we had quarterly payments so none of the payments were late and, and all of the loans uh, remained on schedule uh, and i think the second thing is that when we're working with real estate since the loans are considerably larger we can actually work with the counterparty to to work out a solution so this is what perhaps igor's had in mind when when you have a 1 million euro loan you can go to the developer, sit to the table, and have a negotiation. What you're gonna do next? No, and this is this is increases your flexibility and how you treat the, the the situation dramatically. I think so. I I think that these these two things are are key drivers for real estate loans being more 
um, more uh, stable. stable. Yeah, stable. Okay. Um, so Martinez, your platform is, um, as far as I know, supervised also by the Central Bank of Lithuania, right? Um, what does it mean Correct. In, in terms of competition, uh, but also security? It means that uh, we are not allowed to do things that other platforms do. <laughs> it uh, handcuffs us in some areas where we would like to be more flexible. But, but then on the other hand, it actually, I, I wouldn't say that regulation is um, essential for, for companies that are doing business in the right way but it helps to remove companies that do business in a funny way. So in our example, so let's say uh, Bank of Lithuania is, well, first thing, first thing first is to get a license here, you need to apply to Bank of Lithuania and they have to prove you as a trusted counterparty that you will uh, act according to investors' interests. Uh, they require us to disclose any conflict of interest in case we have any. So this is, for example, was an issue with a lot of peer-to-peer -peer platforms where th there was a conflict of interest and then nobody were dis disclosing it. Then the second, the third thing is uh, Bank of Lithuania has some set of rules. And actually, the regulation we have in Lithuania here is very similar to what we will have in 2022 across the Europe with the European uh, directive for crowdfunding. So, so let's, one of the examples is we actually never uh, touch or see investors' money. We, we are not allowed to have an escrow, well, not, not a deposit account like, like many platforms do in other countries. Therefore, uh, our company risk is, is, well, if we would go default, I hope never, but if we would, uh, then the investor's money is always separated and we never can uh, have a hand on it. So let's say the situations where we had with uh, a couple of uh, those bad, bad stories that, that were taking place in summer when platforms were unable to repay money because they have used it for their own salaries, it's, uh, it's impossible for, uh, to do here in Lithuania. So I think it, it, it sets a good code of conduct, which is enforced. It, it's not just like, you know, industry rule book. No, it's enforced <laughs> rule book. Okay, you, you talked about this uh, segregated accounts. Does it mean that I, when I invest on, on your platform, have my own account on my own name, or is it separated um, in your company? No, we, well, this is exactly what I meant. It, uh, it is not seg it, we don't have your money so it's not separated in our company okay uh, currently we operate in a way that you invest directly from your bank account and you get interest payments directly to your bank account so you don't have any inside wallet uh starting from second quarter this year we will we are signing now a contract with the uh, e-money provider so we will be a an agent for e-money institution where each of our investors will, will, will have a separate IBAN account opened in, in Bank of Lithuania. So you will store your money in Bank of Lithuania and will provide us an access to, to operate it within the platform. So okay. yeah, it's separated at, extremely separated. Uh, it sounds like, like um, we have in Germany, but with uh, better interest rates. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, thanks for your insights about that. Uh, before we switch now to the next topic or to our main topic, um, is there any question from you under each other? What, what do you want to know maybe? No? I wanted to ask Igor, he, he mentioned that he, they work with, uh, with group buying. So maybe he could share a little, I don't know. How did group buying, I, I would expect that there should have been more opportunities during the crisis. Yeah, so, I mean, if, if, if in a few words, so the deals that we had, uh, uh, for example, here in Riga, we had lots of uh, beautiful houses that were built, for example, uh, at 
the beginning of the 20th century. Most of those houses are owned by, by you know, one owner. And uh, for some of those houses, there is also a mortgage from the bank, for example. And those owners are trying to sell those houses, but trying to sell it as a whole. So the last deal who participated in he was selling this house for in a really city centers for a quite large house for 6.5 million dollars. So for the for the investor who was looking to buy this house, that was quite quite a large sum. So obviously, after evaluating, or for example, if we will make some construction in there and we will start selling flats, there is there was it wasn't on any mathematics. So he was selling, he didn't want it so. So, so lower the price, and uh, not only he, but also his creditor, which is one of the four largest banks in Latvia. And so that's where uh, proof buying is, is coming in. So we said that you know, we were able to sell this house by the flats, but we will uh, the deal will happen only only when uh, all hundred percent buyers will be found. So what he's got for that? He's 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 receiving all this money that he wanted. So we are not asking him for any discount, but the end buyer is receiving very large discount because if he would sell this house by the flats, the price would be not 6.5 million euros, but somewhere around 8 million euros. So we made the valuation that we will sell this house under those 6.5 million euros, and the valuator said that this discount on the market would be around 20-25%. So we put this house onto our platform with all those 55 flats, and we were able to sell it in one uh, half month's time uh, for 38, let's say, uh, buyers. Everyone received quite large discount. We also had uh, our investors who participated, uh, even from Germany, we had some buyers from Germany, who gave power of attorneys uh, to the lawyers here in Latvia. So even without applying to Latvia, they were able to, to get those flats. Obviously, we have the happy seller and the happy buyer. So this is the third deal right now uh, with the Balkan state. And now we're looking to, to Estonia, Finland, and we're working closely with Cyprus right now. We have several positions there as well because there are lots of apartment wholesales right now that are selling in, in Cyprus because of the COVID crisis. And we're thinking that it will be very easy to sell those wholesales as an apartment. So even our investors, because from from our seven thousand investors, we have some, some large investors who are able to buy flats as a whole, maybe some larger flats. And uh, that's the idea that we're pushing, uh, pushing with the bulk estate uh, with the crowdfunding as well. Because the crowdfunding in, in this scenario with, with this uh, house that I said, uh, they used the crowdfunding. They raised three hundred to eighty thousand euros for construction works. From the Balk state, and we help them uh, with the proof buying. So it's win win for the Balk state, uh, it's win win for, for the investors and uh, for the buyers. So that's, that's the idea that we're pushing now. And unfortunately, 2020 a little bit, uh, yeah, didn't help us a lot, but uh, 2021, we're looking to at least introduce five or six of uh, these kind of deals uh, for countries. So that's the idea. Sounds interesting. Any more questions? Okay, then let's come to the next important part of this session. And um, this is the question from the title, which was, uh, will we see a delayed impact of COVID-19 in the real estate sector in 2021? So maybe we can continue with Igor's. Uh, what do you think, Igor's? Will we see some, some impact later this year? Um, we are, at least for now, we're starting selling one of our houses, a very beautiful house uh, in, uh, in Riga. We finished the renovation almost. And we are seeing right now that, uh, that the demand is very, very high. So my colleagues are showing the flats two times a day. And uh, we started just last week and we have several floors already reserved. We are pushing forward with our, another house, uh, 40 flats. Uh, it's just at the beginning we were already seeing uh, high demand and uh, people are interested. And we have some, some uh, I mean, I would say some, some changes in the market. So I would say because of the lockdown, I, I think that 
that's that's for every European country. People are looking right now for private houses. And, uh, uh, there is a rise in the private house sector, and uh, the prices are rising in, in Latvia for the private houses. So people are uh, I, I just understood that if one is uh, one is a lockdown and you have to sit uh, at your house, and it's, it's it's nice to have your garden or your small small territory near near your flat. So that's that's uh, some changes in Riga which we are looking, which wasn't there in 2019, and I don't think that. But uh, I mean, the prices, as, as, as my colleagues already showed in the graphs, the prices are back. Uh, the interest is, is very high, and um, I mean, we are very positive. For, at least for the real estate, uh, we are very positive for uh, 2021. We're hoping that on the lockdown will be. I mean, well, there's only problems right now for the real estate is that the notary or the government institutions are still not working. As they were in 2019, they are still under the lockdown. So, for example, if you sell the flat and you can't find the buyer, it's it's a little bit, it's a little more struggle just to sign or for paperwork or, or to get the project approved or something like that. But as, as I said, the lockdown is to be lifted off uh, in in the Baltics in March, we're hoping. And so, I think everybody will everybody will be back on track. Obviously, it will be much better than 2020, but I hope it will return to 2019. And uh, yeah, we're looking at, I mean, probably uh, just uh, looking forward. Yeah. Thanks for it. Uh, Edgar, do you want to continue? Um, yeah, I, I would like to continue. So I think uh, definitely there will be a, a significant impact from the COVID within the real estate industry, not only in Riga or Baltics, but uh, in general, globally. Um, I will not be very original. Uh, you most probably have heard that uh, what COVID did, it just accelerated the trends which were uh, already uh, happening. And we see a few of them, for instance, if we talk about e-commerce, it was growing uh, year on year basis, but now the e-commerce has grown like exponentially. Uh, for instance, that uh, let us believe that uh, the logistics or warehouse projects which solve last mile uh, delivery problem within the city, those will benefit from this trend. So, for instance, that's why we are um, developing now a 15,000 square meter warehouse project in Riga. Uh, so, that's one example. The other example, um, I would most probably recommend everyone to... Uh, uh, sell everything you have in the hotel industry. I doubt it will uh, come back uh, as soon as some people uh, tend to hope. So, for instance, we are evaluating two deals now where there are uh, hotels for sale and we plan to convert them in apartment buildings. Uh, that's something uh, which I think will stay for quite uh, some time. Then, if we look at uh, what what's happening with the younger generation, they prefer uh, use uh, not to own or rent not to own. We see that with the uh, car sharing uh, platforms which have developed uh, significantly in Baltics and in Europe in general. And then the same goes for real estate. Uh, this younger generation is not so keen to own a building or own an apartment. Um, of course, it's kind of, it depends person by person, but we see the trend that they would prefer to to use the place for some time and not to bother about uh, all the ownership problems that come with. So development of uh, multifamily housing or as Brits say, uh, built to rent, this is something what we believe as well. Uh, so it's like a rental house uh, for residential and uh, such projects will pop up in uh, Baltic capitals uh, the next couple of years, I believe. Uh, what else? Uh, yeah, the retail trend, what we see is that the um, shopping centers, the, the large, large scale shopping centers, the top three most probably are doing somehow uh, in future. Okay, but uh, all the rest of them, it's going to be tricky. And what really works is the, um, how you call it, uh, neighborhood shopping center, which is a typical uh, grocery store with uh, satellites. These ones are working very well because uh, these essential goods are still uh, being bought uh, 
for the face-to-face -face interaction in the shop mostly. So that's something what we believe is going to stay. Um, in terms of, uh, yeah, I think ah, office, the one of the most challenging, um, let's say, decisions for every real estate investment uh, field participant is to make a mind up what's going to happen with offices because it's easy to say what's going to happen with hotels or with retail or with logistics, but what's going to happen with offices, that's the most challenging one. And uh, we've spent so much time on research and uh, analyzing the trends. We have done some uh, surveys with the potential tenants and we see a very interesting shift uh, in the office industry. So there, there are businesses which are uh, focused on uh, knowledge of people. Mostly these are IT companies, but also a lot of uh, businesses working in so-called creative industries. And for them, uh, there is no trend to grow the office space in the future. Um, this uh, remote working, they see that it works very well and they will have offices, but this will be totally different office, not what we have seen before. It's going to be uh, more like a social hub for the company where they can uh, extend their organizational uh, culture where they can uh, create a space for employees to work on their team projects and so on. And then, of course, we have a huge uh, market with a so-called status quo office uh, tenants, which most probably is going to stay. So our bet is that in the Riga city center, the uh, new office will be totally different as we have seen it before. And that's why we have one project in this sector as well. And we're going to do some more. We really believe so. But this we only see in the very city center. We don't talk about the Skanska CBD or other locations. This will be only in the very city center, which will work as a talent magnet where people tend to come by to socialize, to talk about joint projects and so on and on and on. So yeah, uh, summarizing, I think that uh, the impact of COVID we'll see in the next three to four years. I forgot to mention one important thing, uh, the ventilation. One of very costly systems in development is the ventilation. Uh, and this is going to cost a lot in the future projects because, for instance, what we are putting now in the buildings, uh, none of developers till now have done it in Riga. And we understand that it's not about COVID, but it's about the hygiene and, uh, and safety of the people who spend time in these buildings. So the ventilation quality, I think that will be the number one question from every tenant in the future. Okay, thanks. Very, very cool details and the insights. Um, Martinez, do you have something to add to this? Yeah, I think uh, I think in from a standpoint of an investor, uh, the, the major question is how did <clears throat> COVID-19 affect liquidity and price of real estate? that uh, people have as a collateral or where they invest, invest as in equity, right? So the, as, as the quarantine started, and as I showed in, 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 the, in the graphs and what Edgar showed, uh, market activity stopped, but prices didn't drop as dramatically as we were, uh, we were afraid of. So I think the first lesson that, that we learned from the past 12 months that was that regardless of increasing real estate prices in the Baltics, uh, the growth has been very sustainable and we don't have a bubble in the real estate market as we had in 2008. So, uh, so as it says, you know, no two crises are the same. So 2008 was real estate crisis where real estate was affected the most because a lot of because there were a lot of speculative deals and 2020 showed that that real estate is no longer a place for speculation so market prices even though they can fluctuate a little they will definitely not go you know up or down more than 5 to 10% a year which gives a lot of confidence for the investors that you know the, the the collateral that they have uh, for their investments is a is a solid hideout from 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 uh, uh, from scares of of of, uh, of the world. Uh, and the second thing is the liquidity. 
which indicates right you know whether you can sell the thing at the same price so and the liquidity again both in vilnius and what i see in riga shows that since market growth was based not on speculation but on actual need uh, we should consider real estate and, and in particular residential real estate as a commodity, so it's you know it's just something people buy at the marketplace uh, in in in, the, in a shopping center. It's just that you buy it uh, once every ten year, uh, and it costs much more. So, so it, it it looks like real estate as a collateral remains a very solid uh, foundation for investments to be secure. And actually, we were even having discussion whether real estate collateral perhaps it's even safer than a bank deposit because bank deposit is uh, insured up to 100,000 euros while real estate if the collateral is of of higher value can be insured you know for whatever the amount you're investing so i think these are very two important things and lessons that that uh, 2020 show uh, presented us and then when it comes to you know to to whether we have a whether we're going to have a whiplash, whether we, whether there is any uh, delay in the in, in how will market uh, react. At least in Vilnius, it doesn't seem so. Uh, the uh, the residential market, even though we had the small drop, it recovered. Uh, I guess we will have a. a a couple of months delay in in you no know, in new supply coming in because some developments were not even starting for three months so we will eventually have this strange period next year where for three or four months no new buildings will be finished so it will be strange in in, in statistical sense uh, from a shopping center standpoint here at least in lithuania it doesn't sound that they're having any struggles they're well i mean they, they have some issues but it's manageable and the office buildings even though there was a lot of conversation about now it's you know it will be age of uh, work from home that it's finally going online transformation everyone i know who are working from home are praying when will they get back to office so so it doesn't feel like uh, uh, no, th that there would be a lot of tenants uh, discontinuing their rent contracts actually <laughs> everyone are looking forward to to move back to their office place and uh, and run away from their teenage children who are studying from home as well so i think that so, that, so i think that there there were two things one was the lesson that uh, real estate as a collateral is very solid and another one that market participants are are active and they're looking forward to come back to business as usual. Maybe there will be some shift, shift in logistics, but otherwise real estate will be business as usual in the, in the future. And if we assume, assume uh, we will be still in lockdowns the whole year in, in Europe, um, would this change your actual opinion? Or would you say, yeah, then this counts also for the next year? Or would this be very, very bad also for the real estate? I think you know, when thinking of real estate, and when we are talking not about uh, real well, new development, but of, of, of already built buildings, right? Um, we should look at real estate as a commodity, also in terms of it costs money to make real estate. You know, it's it just has some underlying value. You, if you have a, if you have a house it costs something to build it. I mean, even if you, even if it's a, it's a, it's a crazy crisis, it will always sell at least for its uh, production value or a slight discount. But if there will be demand, uh, the price should not drop lower than, than what it costs to make it. So, so I think that's, and then, you know, and if, if it would, you know, go towards that direction, uh, real estate market has another, uh, safety net or safety trigger, safety mechanism, that if it, if things start to sell in the secondary market for cheaper than what it was to build them, there will be no new supply coming in. 
which will limit the general market supply and then that will prevent prices from falling further down so it's not like with uh, trading oil that you know oil refineries cannot stop there just pumping and pumping and pumping no it, real estate developers will react very fast you know and this this uh, 2020 showed that you know the next month after uh, uh, sales stop everyone stopped their construction sites so it was complete halt and new demand stopped as well and then when business got back to usual in three months, we had a healthy supply coming in. Okay, thanks for this. Um, anyone want something to add? Or otherwise, we are coming now to the questions from the uh, participants, from, from the audience, because we are running out of time. But feel free Mark, to ask. I have uh, one, small, one small remark, if, if I can, if I may. Sure. I think that, that the only, if, if we are staying in the lockdown for another year, uh, I think that the most uh, vulnerable market will be the retailers who are having small shops. So this will be the challenge, you know, how will they operate, whether they will move to, to e-commerce e or not. Because, uh, you know, if you have a <clears throat> cafe chain which operates in the largest shopping mall, well, then this year you had zero turnover. And this is really who, who, who will suffer the most, not the office buildings, not the, the shopping malls as such that as assets. The yeah. cash flows may, may be affected, but not the, the, the assets. I would also agree to this if I see the situation here in Germany. Um, one or two months are okay, but um, if you are going into a, a range of six months or so, it would be very serious. Yeah. But yeah, cool. Thank you for the discussion, guys. Um, I would say let's come now to some questions from the audience. Um, we have some. The first one is a very general one from, from Mario. He's asking, where are the next destinations in the world to invest? So who wants to answer this? Vilnius, definitely. <laughs> okay, explain this. <laughs> Uh, I think that, you know, when we're talking about destinations to invest, uh, we have to bear in mind uh, risk and reward that you can get from going into those markets. And uh, at this, and, you know, and, and this uh, makes, you know, Germany and Germany, Netherlands, Belgium, all the Benelux countries that, you know, you are considered to be Western Europe and therefore secondary mortgage, second rank mortgage will go at 4% interest rate anyway. And it just, it does, just doesn't go any higher. It's, it's Germany. Uh, you know, the further you go to, to the east of Europe, uh, you have increase in interest rates. And I don't think that you have it because it is of greater risk, countries of greater risk. You actually have it because it's still not considered to be mainland Europe or it's not Europe for long enough. We have uh, yields compressing, so real estate is getting more expensive, but relative to people's income, it's still rather cheap. It's, it's cheap to buy an apartment here, cheap, much cheaper to live in Vilnius than to live in Berlin in your own apartment. So which makes that, you know, especially if, if we are talking about remote work or, or work from different offices around the world, most of, most likely people will start moving to cities that are cheaper and more, you know, quality of life is better there. So it's one thing. Uh, and then the, the second one goes, you know, in, in, in regards. So, you know, if you would like to earn more and, uh, and, and where is the balance? So I think that another very important thing is to understand for investors, what is the, uh, legal background for each country. So, for example, there is this specific that in Spain you cannot get a mortgage for a crowdfunding project. So you will never, never, if, if there is a real estate as an asset, it will never, never be a collateral. And let's say if you go to Italy, in Italy, uh, mortgage will cost three percent of. So, it means that instead of sparing those 3% for the investors, you will have to pay for the government. So you need to consider this 
blend of, of facts to understand why is it really, why, is it, why do Baltic countries can pay more at the same risk level? And I think at this, at this time, Baltics is really a, a unique place here because it's underbanked, it's too small for new players to come in. And therefore, alternative financing companies are springing up. That's why it's so active here. Yes, nice pitch for your country. Uh, anyone wants something to add? Sure. Um, if I may, uh, I will be maybe not so uh, such a good salesperson as Martinez. I, if someone, uh, I would suggest to look at uh, Tech City's rating. Okay, I think in real estate. I may have, I will repeat most probably. So I suggest to invest in tech cities. You see uh, several tops of tech cities globally. Um, I would suggest to avoid uh, cities like uh, London, New York, uh, Moscow, the large cities. Uh, most probably the growth of uh, real estate prices is not uh, so much for the future. I think I think what Edgar says is is and it's it's really a decent point uh, that you should look either to satellite cities for these met met metropolis metropolises or or you should look for capitals of mid-sized countries where you know where capital is not excessively huge but it's still a capital you know we were even making making laugh that you know it it costs the same to buy apartments here in Vilnius. And to buy a house in uh, in Leeds or Manchester, but but you, you but Manchester is not a capital. You don't have U two concerts going there. <laughs> so, so you know that, that that's that's the benefit of having cap, living in a capital, and therefore capital will always have this uh, value value a halo around it. Yeah, it would be great to have an, an UK platform here in the panel to to answer also on the, about this. But let's let's move to the next question. It's uh, from our fellow Finfella. It's from Jettin. Um, he asked, based on all your experiences, what is the average size of investment you are experiencing without having to have offline engagement with the investor? Mm. For us, this average, I think it's. I think we could actually talk about something like 10 to 12,000 euros right now. Uh, and, and to give, to give a range, uh, we could have, well, from hundred euros for someone who is uh, making a lot of small investments to a hundred thousand euros uh, of someone who is a typical fund client. And finds us as a, a as a nice attractive alternative for 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 a fund investment. Okay, thanks. You also want something to add, or this is for us. I mean, uh, uh, I think we have uh, we have investors even, for example, uh, who are investing. Uh, 250,000 euros, for example, and we never even uh, spoke with them or even contact with them. So it's it's uh, it just depends. And for example, the investor who's investing uh, 100 euros to each project, we're in, in constant, for example, communication with them and explaining something. So so it depends. But uh, right now, we're trying obviously to work offline. With, with the largest, uh, larger investors, I mean, uh, I would say there's no difference for us. Uh, as, as I said, it's, uh, there, there could be some large investors who are investing without even asking something, but there are also some other investors who is, who are coming to, to our office sometime and uh, yeah, we want, want, to, want to have a chat and want to just just to have a look to how we really hear and uh, where I have some some investors. Uh, from, from Estonia, from Latvia, who's visiting the objects as well, and we're, we're showing what has been done. So 
So I mean, I would say there is it's 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 it's, it's not the time that I'm not going to invest in the job. It's just it's, it's just yeah. Thank you. So we are coming to the next question. This is also from Jetin. Um, he asked, what are the typical funding rates where you are for senior debt, mezzanine debt, and equity? So maybe I can, can start. So sure. for senior debt, we are currently having interest rates ranging from 6 to 11%. Uh, and we see a trend for interest rates to contract, and, and I think that we will land at what I mentioned before, you know, within a year or two, we will have that interest rate for a complete cash flow asset will be 5 to 6%, and real estate development with a decent developer and, and reasonable business plan will go at 6 to 7, 8%. And so that's for senior debt. Uh, for mezzanine, actually, we when we started our platform, we we were planning to do mezzanine. Uh, however, uh, it there was a slight change of plans when we came across the fact that banks would not provide the second rank mortgages. So, and since banks are the main lender in the in in, Vil in Lithuania at least. So mezzanine as an as an instrument is very difficult to control. You, you don't have any collaterals in, in that case. So we decided to to step away from mezzanine as it's uh, as it doesn't mm, doesn't provide necessary protection for the investors or, or or what we consider to be necessary. And equity, we haven't done equity yet. We have been considering it. But we see a trend that, again, strong developers, at least in Lithuania, again, are reluctant to share equity deals per se. Right? That usually they will they would say you come into equity, but you actually get like a very expensive loan. So which is which is mezzanine? Uh, so I guess it it. You know, when when we talk to equity, Lithuania is quite. Um, I think we are in the very very early stage for equity investments, and therefore we don't have much to to share on. Thanks for answering. Um, anyone else want to add on this question, or should we proceed to the next one? Yeah. So right now it's almost 12, so it's 14. Uh, we do not have classical equity, so I would say there's, there's, no, there's no dispute there. But with, with the mezzanine, uh, we are giving only, only for, for the partner, for the companies that we are really, really know and we really, really know the financial situation from the inside, not, not, only, not only just from the documents that they're providing. So we have only several mezzanine. Then it's, it's it's quite high. The, the interest rate could be up to up to eighteen percent because uh, the risks are high, obviously. Because it's a mezzanine. If there's a senior loan and all that, then obviously the the, the main creditor uh, has a first hand on on the collateral. So we have only out of out of the hundred loans, we have only I would say just several, less than five, less than loans. All of those were expensive. So. Thanks for that. So the next question, if I invest in Baltic country as a passive investor, how do you see residential property needs in 15 years as we see remote worker migrate to wear a small sun and post work activities? Can I start? Sure. At least, uh, at least with me, I would say I would say it's, it's very simple because uh, because the problem in, in Riga, it's especially in Riga, is that we, we discussed it before with investors, is that, that we have lots of buildings that were built uh, in in uh, in USSR. It's, it's those buildings around 1970s, 1980s, 
and those buildings right now are very bad shape, but most of the population in Riga still lives in those conditions, and what they're, they're searching is to, to change and to move to either, either new developments or the related but so the demand for, for the new housing is still very, very, very high, and so we're expecting that that's why, uh, that's why uh, buying, uh, for example, in the city center, uh, multi-flat house, for example, which is not renovated, but which uh, were built in, uh, during the beginning of the 20th century, it's, it's just, it's very profitable still. We have, uh, as a developers uh, in an offline, we have several buildings in here, and we, and we are buying them, renovating, putting the elevator, and it's still, and we're going into business for, and I would say 10 years right now, and it's still, it's still profitable, it's still high demand, and it's very easy to sell. Because, again, I mean, those, those, those houses that were built in and around the USSR, but all around the Riga, uh, there are still lots of families that are living in there, and they just, I mean, uh, unfortunately, they do not have where to move in. I mean, if you can see new development, then uh, the prices for the housing are quite high, I would say it's, uh, over 2,000 euros per square meter, which for Riga is quite high. But when, for example, you are buying uh, this uh, old house and you're renovating, you are able to, to, to you should use the flats for, I don't know, for 1,500, 1,600,000 euros per square meter, which, which is, I mean, it's still very interesting for the buyer, it's still profitable for the developer. So that's, uh, if you're investing good voltages, I would say, in years' time, we still uh, we have the opportunities to, to make some profit. I mean, if you invest smart, obviously, if you're not buying this USSR flat uh, in a bad shape, then, then, then you're screwed. I mean, it's the, uh, you won't be able to sell it in three years' time. But if it's a nice investment, I think uh, for the residential purpose, obviously, not the office, then uh, you're able to make some profit and you, you will be able to do that. Okay, thanks for answering. Maybe we have time for one more question. One question is to Martinez. Um, please explain how do Lithuanian developers with exposure from the bank would stop development without completing the project and without submitting it if and when demand drops? Uh, not entirely sure if, if I get the question right, but uh... Let me try to give you a perspective of how would uh, bank and the developer look at it and how actually we look at it as well. And this perhaps will also a bit, uh, will be a small addition to what Igor said about, about how to make a smart investment in, in real estate. So when we are evaluating a real estate project, when we are evaluating it as an investment for Rongen uh, investors, uh, one of the major questions that we are asking ourselves and that we are considering is, so what will we do if something goes not according to the plan? What are we going to do if sale will not go as planned? What will we do if, <clears throat> if the building permit will not come into, will not be available as needed? What we will do if the construction will get delayed? Or what are we going to do if COVID-19 strikes? So when you have all these questions, you know, it, it, you actually come to, to one important conclusion that whenever you go into a deal, you have to commit to it. So this is something what both banks and we do. So it's, you know, when, uh, and this, this is where, where I will touch upon what Igor said. So when we are talking about real estate investments and in terms of loans, so I, for example, I, I am strong opponent for what some platforms do when they say LTV for this stage is 70% and we are financing this development because it it makes uh, it, it may bring a situation where the next stage will not be available because LTV will be 75. So what's really important to understand is when you commit, so when banks commit and when we, we commit we commit 100% that we will finance this project till the very end because for the investor or for a bank, in, for, in this case, there is nothing worse than having a half-finished building. So 
and it's the same for the developer. It's it's better to have a well, let's, let's call it uh, warehouse of flats or, or or stock of apartments that were not sold, but are available for for uh, a general mass than having a half built building which you have already invested yourself bank had invested and you know and you can't do anything with it so so what will so yeah so so wrapping it up so what would both both bank developer and Rongen would do we would commit to the very end to get a finished construction so the the asset would be in its final shape uh so that it would become liquid for the final user and the interesting thing here is that when you have the finished building you can you know you can uh you can sell it off you can rent it out you can refinance it you can uh there is the same conservate it and and and, and wait out for half a year and then sell it off so it's it's in all the cases it's much better than to stop halfway through so in in unless some extreme situation uh i think it would not happen in uh, back in 2008 in vilnius there were a couple of cases like that but all of them were fraudulent so the, it it was not the the initiative of the bank or 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 the lender to to stop the construction it usually was that the developer was as i said a funny guy okay thanks for answering the question as i uh, read it <laughs> okay. okay yeah, yeah okay. just uh, on the question uh, so uh, one thing that happened with baltic states uh, and all the capitals of baltic states is that uh, with entering the eu uh, there was a huge difference uh, between the salary levels of uh, baltic states and uh, western european countries so uh, large uh, amount of people living in baltic states moved to great britain uh, germany etc cetera, etc cetera. um during last 10 years uh the the growth of uh baltic economies has been significant and uh from we have a we have a actually achieved a level where the uh, gdp per capita is already considerable uh whether we if we look at the the old European countries, let's say this way, and uh, the uh, purchase uh, uh, index for the people who come back from UK or Germany is much higher than it was uh, 10 years ago. So basically, we see the trend that migration comes back. The people who have spent several years abroad and worked there, they see that they actually could do much better in their uh, resident uh, homes. So uh, what happened in Tallinn in the last few years is that uh, instead of uh, having uh, immigration, uh, the people started to come back and so the, uh, the city grew. And I believe that this happens most probably in, in Riga and in Vilnius uh, lately as well. So more people uh, who 10 years ago went abroad, they will come back to these cities. And therefore, the amount of people living in the cities, uh, Riga, Vilnius, uh, Tallinn, I believe will grow. Uh, I can say the same for the secondary cities in Baltic uh, states, but most probably the capitals will grow for the next uh, 10, 15 years. I will, uh, yeah, I will, I, I will agree with what Edgar said. And uh, for the past two years, we see a positive migration in Lithuania. And in Vilnius, we have growth uh which is i think it's it's every year we have two percent growth in population and to give you some you know perspective what two percent means even though it sounds very little it means that we have demand for four to five thousand flats every year for new residents coming over so back in 2019 when we had the, it was a record year for real estate market here and we had a lot of discussion going on with in all the conferences with the same topic so is it market overheating or or what and we did analysis every major real estate developer did analysis and what we saw was there were three factors one was people are earning considerably more 
So there, there are a lot of shared service centers coming in. Uh, the workforce is becoming more educated. So they earn more, they start working in international companies. So salaries are going, you know, becoming more Western. The second one, the population was growing considerably as well. So there were every year, there were another two, three, 4,000 people coming over to the city. So they needed to live somewhere. And the third one was that uh, due to competition in the real estate market, the prices of, of, of uh, apartments didn't, raise, uh, didn't rise uh, as fast as the purchasing power did. So relative affordability of apartment became much higher than what it was three or four years ago. And therefore you have this booming city. You know, if you, if you travel through Vilnius, you can count, you know, you can count uh, cranes that are working and you can count construction sites. It's really amazing how much things are going on here. So, you know, it feels like uh, we have more construction going on than London does. And that's uh, really great. And in Riga, I think it, it feels the same when you travel there. I know a lot of developers are, are looking to Riga as, uh, as the next Vilnius, you know, it's like growing town, growing capital. Okay, thank you for answering the last question and added a couple of minutes to the panel. Um, we are now at the end of the question block. So we uh, clarified the question, at least for now, why we will probably not see a delayed impact on real estate in 2021. And uh, we also learned that 2021 will again a big challenge, of course. Yeah, I would say thank you to all um, for all your input about your platforms and sharing your knowledge with the community. And let's hope for us all that we will have a more calm year than 2020 was. <laughs>